Superman. Full face, open face, composite, cheapo sh They save our face, our head, and they make us look cool. But where do they come from? The very first kind of looks like a helmet thing was the flat cap, worn by riders in the early 1900s. Riders wore these to, as they said, keep their hair in order. They didn't really work that well in terms of protecting the rider's head in the event of a crash. The first helmet that provided some amount of protection for the rider's head was developed at Brooklands Racetrack in England. Brooklands was the first ever purpose-built racetrack and many riders went there to test their skills, often crashing with devastating results. Dr. Eric Gardner witnessed many of these crashes and developed helmets made out of canvas and shellac. Those helmets helped to spread the load of the impact over a larger area, thus reducing reducing the stress concentration. They provided some amount of protection for the rider's head, but not as much as a modern, shock-absorbing helmet. The use of helmets in European road racing became mainstream fairly early on, and US board track racers caught on pretty early as well. But the general public was still very skeptical about the effectiveness of helmets, and so were lawmakers. In 1935, the famous T.E. Lawrence, a national hero in England, flew over the handlebars on its Bruff Superior while avoiding two bicyclists. He suffered severe head injuries and died six days later. One of the medics attending Lawrence, Hugh Cairns, was very moved by Lawrence's death and decided to research and promote the use of helmets for motorcycle riders. Cairns faced a lot of resistance, but got a breakthrough in 1941 when the British Army made helmets compulsory for dispatch riders. Helmets had a use within aviation as well, and a lot of money was being poured into the research of helmets to protect pilots' heads. In 1947, Professor C. F. Lombard and Herman P. Roth publicized their research and development of shock-absorbing helmets for aviation. They had found that during an impact, the pilot's brain bounces around inside of the skull, which is one of the main mechanisms that causes head injuries. They figured that they needed to extend the stopping time so that the brain would bounce around less violently. Their solution was to add a shock-absorbing layer of foam between the rider's head and the hard outer shell of the helmet, crushing on impact. In 1956, race car driver Pete Snell died in an impact while wearing a shock-absorbing helmet. Because of this, a bunch of his friends and researchers decided to set up a standardized way to test the effectiveness of shock-absorbing helmets. Snell was the first of many foundations that test the performance of helmets. Today, there are many different standards. All of them use a head-shaped device called a head form that is secured inside of the helmet. The helmet with the head form is dropped onto an anvil, and then data from the sensors inside is collected to determine how well the helmet handled the impact. Manufacturers are able to tune the deceleration upon impact by varying the density and amount of foam. Where the helmet is struck is very important. If it's from the front, if it's from the top, if it's from the side, the different standards have different ways of doing this. Because of these differences in how to measure the effectiveness of helmets, there have been many controversies over the years regarding all of these standards. For instance, Snell 2005 faced controversy because it did not consider heads of varying weights. DOT has been criticized for not updating their maximum allowable energy transfer of 400 G to the more common 275 G. ECE has been criticized for having too low energy testing, not applicable to the higher average speeds of US traffic. The list goes on. At the end of the day, you need to select a helmet that fulfills the standards required by law wherever you live or the racing organization which you're racing in. Helmets in the 1950s did not have any face protection at all. If we look at a breakdown of data over where helmets are most commonly damaged in a crash, we can see that you definitely want face protection. The R&D department at Bell saw this early on and introduced the first full face helmet in 1963. From the 1970s all the way up until today, manufacturers started making more and more specialized helmets, or helmets designed specifically for certain types of use, such as motocross helmets, road racing helmets, street bike oriented helmets, and so forth. All with features and foam densities specific to that type of riding. For instance, a motocross rider will experience impacts at very different speeds from, say, a MotoGP rider. From the 1970s up until today, manufacturers have spent a lot of time optimizing different features of the helmets, such as visibility, ventilation, chin strap retention, ease of removal in the event of a crash, comfort, penetration protection, and aerodynamics. Manufacturers were using carbon fiber to make shells as early as in the 1970s, and this is still the best material to make shells out of, because it keeps the weight down and can be designed in a way where the shell flexes to absorb energy without shattering. 
The reason carbon fiber isn't used for all motorcycle helmets today is because the expenses of designing and manufacturing them. Therefore, some helmets are made out of fiberglass, which performs slightly worse than carbon fiber, but is easier to manufacture. Or thermoplastics, which is easier to design and manufacture, but has worse performance. One of the most important things to consider when buying a helmet is that it fits your head properly. If it doesn't fit your head properly, then all the test results that you can find for that helmet are not going to be valid. Remember to subscribe to my channel. There's always something new to learn. It's gotta be against the law to look this damn good. Cause baby, I feel real good and I wish I was.